Hi, I'm Sue Goganian, Director of Historic Beverly. This is the John Cabot House, the headquarters for Historic Beverly, and we are delighted to have a copy of the Declaration of Independence printed in Salem in 1776 in our exhibit gallery. Once we reopen this month, we invite you to come by and see it. Admission will be free. The Declaration was first read to the citizens of Beverly on July 17th, 1776, a day before it was read in Boston. And we've asked some of Beverly's citizens to read it to you today. The words written so long ago are as significant now as they were then. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their po just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly, proposing with manly firmness of his invasion on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time, after such dissolution, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative power, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all dangers of invasion from without in convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither 
in raising the conditions of new appropriation of lands. He's obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for his tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of offices to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislator. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they sh should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefit of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in the neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to, to legislate for all of us in all cases whatsoever, he has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coast, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny begun with the circumstances of cruel, cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled with the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy of the head of the state of a nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive of the higher seas, to bear arms against their country, to become executioners of their friends and of their brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has dowered to bring our inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages who have known rule of warfare and his undistinguished destruction of all ages and sexes and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we petitions our redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is ruled and marked by every act which is defined a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of free people. Nor have been wanting in attentions to our British brethren we have warned them from time to time of attempts by the legislator to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed of their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conquered them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which inevitably will interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been dealt a voice of justice and continuity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, peace, and friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, 
we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Even when the Declaration was first discussed in 1776, there was conflict about those who were excluded from life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and how the founders could espouse these ideals when people of color and women were excluded. In 1852, Frederick Douglass, who was born enslaved and became a leading abolitionist and writer, delivered an oration entitled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? This cha challenged Americans to live up to the full meaning of the Declaration. We offer brief excerpts from that speech now. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men too, great enough to give fame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes. And for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him, more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impotence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. It is the antagonistic force in your government, the only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union. It fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, the deadly foe of education. It fosters pride. It breeds insolence. It promotes vice. It shelters crime. It is a curse to the earth that supports it. And yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. Oh, be warned, be warned, a horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster, and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. Allow me to say, in conclusion, Notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which much inevitably work the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened and the doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began with hope. Withdrawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, and the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. 
In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let every heart join in saying it, God speed the year of Jubilee, the wide world o'er, when from their galling chains set free, the oppressed shall vilely bend the knee, and wear the yoke of tyranny like brutes no more. That year will come and freedom's reign to all their plundered rights again restore. God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow. In every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood and each return for evil good, not blow for blow. That day will come all feuds to end and change into a faithful friend each foe. As we commemorate Independence Day, let us work toward a country that offers life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to everyone so that all may celebrate the fulfillment of the promise of the United States. Thank you for joining us for this special program. Please consider supporting Historic Beverly so that we may continue to share Beverly's history with everyone. Thank you.